Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. So this week we are continuing looking through the Ten Commandments. And this week we're up to the commandment of you shall not steal. And as we've done with all of these commandments, I want us to try to sort of lift our minds and take kind of a higher perspective on this. Because there's obvious examples of stealing that we can think of. You know, when we think of stealing, what comes to mind is probably going into a store and filling our pockets full of candy bars or something, or breaking into someone's house and taking their things. Those are really obvious examples of breaking these commandments that hopefully none of us ever do, that that's not something that's really a part of our life. But if we lift our minds up and look, there's subtler ways that I think this commandment shows up in all of our lives, in ways that I think we all rub up against this. And so that's what I want us to think about this morning. And with the children, we talked about the story of Achan, where after the children of Israel defeated their enemies at Jericho, Achan stole a robe and some silver and a wedge of gold, took them in his tent and hid them in hopes that no one would find them. But then after the children of Israel were defeated at Ai in a battle that they should have been able to win easily, the Lord told Joshua, someone has stolen here. And he tells him how he's going to go and find the person who stole. And so I read some of it to the children, but I want to read the end of the story to all of you this morning, starting from uh, Joshua finding out who did it by lot. It says, So Joshua rose early in the morning and brought Israel by their tribes, and the tribe of Judah was taken. He brought the clan of Judah, and he took the family of the Zarites. And he brought the family of the Zarites man by man, and Zabdi was taken. Then he brought his household man by man, and Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, was taken. Now Joshua said to Achan, My son, I beg you, give glory to the Lord God of Israel, and make confession to him. And tell me now what you have done. Do not hide it from me. And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and this is what I have done. When I saw among the spoils a beautiful Babylonian garment, 200 shekels of silver, and a wedge of gold weighing 50 shekels, I coveted them and took them. And there they are, hidden in the earth in the midst of my tent, with the silver under it. So Joshua sent messengers, and they ran to the tent, and there it was, hidden in his tent, with the silver under it. And they took them from the midst of the tent, brought them to Joshua and to all the children of Israel, and laid them out before the Lord. Then Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan, the son of Zerah, the silver, the garment, the wedge of gold, his sons, his daughters, his oxen, his donkeys, his sheep, his tent, and all that he had, and they brought them to the valley of Achor. And Joshua said, Why have you troubled us? The Lord will trouble you this day. So all Israel stoned him with stones, and they burned them with fire after they had stoned them with stones. Then they raised over him a great heap of stones, still there to this day. So the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger. Therefore, the name of that place has been called Valley of Achor to this day. Now, this is a story that always makes me squirm every time I read it. Because this isn't a story with a happy ending. It's not a story of redemption, where someone recognizes the error of his ways and then moves forward beginning a new life. No, this is a story, basically, of crime and punishment. And because of what Achan did, I think the thing that stands out to me, and I think to a lot of us probably, is that Achan committed this crime. He stole these things that he wasn't supposed to steal. And yet in the end, it's not just Achan who has to pay the price, but his entire family is stoned and burned to death. It's a, it's a horrible, gruesome fate for everyone around him. 
And it feels unfair. We think, why should all of his family have to suffer for his choices? Why was it that his sin had to bring all of this on everyone around him? And I think to understand why the punishment is so severe in this story for breaking this commandment, I think we need to look at what it really means to steal and what this really looks like for us in our lives. And so with that, I want to turn to the teachings of the new church, and I want to share with you all a passage from the true Christian religion, which talks about this commandment and what it means. It says, In the natural sense, this commandment forbids theft, robbery, and piracy in times of peace, and in general, the taking away of anyone's property secretly or under any pretext whatsoever. It extends also to all forms of imposition and unlawful gain, usury and exaction, as well as to the payment of stated contributions and taxes and the discharge of debts. Workers transgress this commandment when they carry out their work dishonestly and deceptively. Merchants who practice deception in regard to their goods in respect of weight, measure, and the accounts they render and officers who fail to pay soldiers their just wages. Judges also transgress against it, who are influenced by friendship, bribery, relationship, or any other cause in giving judgment, by perverting the laws and corrupting the course of justice, and who thus deprive others of property which they legally possess. In the celestial sense, thieves represent people who take away divine power from the Lord, and also those who claim for themselves his merit and righteousness. Such people, even if they worship God, do not have faith in him, but in themselves. Nor do they believe in God, but only in themselves. So this passage is saying that there's obvious examples of stealing, of theft and robbery that we think of. But it says that it continues down and says that workers break this commandment when they do their work dishonestly and deceptively. When we find ourselves trying to cut corners in our work, when we find ourselves trying to take the easy way and see if there's ways that we can sort of game the system, that's breaking this commandment. And it says merchants who are dishonest about their products or about the weights and measures if they're charging exorbitant amounts to try to make sure they can get as much as they can possibly get from other people, that is breaking this commandment. And I think we all have areas of our lives where we do this. We all have areas where we find ourselves wanting to cut corners, wanting to do things the easy way rather than doing them the right way. And, you know, I saw this all the time when I I used to work in the trades, and there were times that you'd come against some people where they would say, well, I could do this the right way, but it would be cheaper and quicker and easier for me to just do it like this. And by the time the customer ever sees it, the walls will be put up around it and they'll never know. So they know they're still gonna get paid the same amount as if they had done it right, but they are just trying to get away with doing less there, and they think that they can get away with it. And this is the thing that is so dangerous about this commandment, is that just like Achan, which we talked about with the children, it wasn't just that he stole things. It was that after he stole them, he tried to hide it. He was deceptive, and he thought he could get away with it. And I think so often when we find ourselves being tempted to cut corners, when we find ourselves tempted to take the easy way instead of the right way, We think, well, no one's going to see, no one's going to know the difference, so what's the harm in doing this? But then I think this leads us to the part of the story that I think really stands out to a lot of us, which is that it's not just Achan who has to pay for his own sin, but it's his family who gets punished because of that. And this is the thing, is when we do this, when we try to take the easy way and we find ourselves cutting corners and breaking this commandment in these more subtle ways, even if we're getting away with it on the surface and our our boss doesn't notice or our customers don't notice or whoever it is around us doesn't seem to notice what's going on, 
what we are doing is we are building a habit of doing that in our lives. And what effect is that going to have in other areas? You know, if I'm someone who loves to cut corners and take the easy way, how much is that energy going to help me in my marriage? How am I going to be able to be a good spouse if I'm always trying to do things the easy way or always trying to make sure I'm getting what I want out of every situation? Or how is it going to impact my relationship with my children if I'm not willing to do the work and show up for them the way that they need, but instead I want to do what I want to do and focus on what I can get out of it? Or with any of my relationships? So the reality is when we do these things in secret, when we think no one's going to know, no one's going to see, we are building a habit that in the end will make it so that we aren't the only ones who are paying for our transgressions, but all of the people we love around us are going to be the ones paying the price. Our marriages will suffer. Our relationships will suffer. And that's why this is such an intense punishment that Achan and his family experience because of this. And the other thing I want to point out is that this is an incredibly harsh punishment. And we might think, what kind of loving God would, would have an entire family stoned and burned? But in the New Church, we're told that any time the Word talks about the Lord punishing people, it's an appearance. The Lord doesn't punish any of us. But rather, our own actions bring about those natural consequences. But a lot of times, it can look on the surface like the Lord's the one punishing us. If we go down this path and we allow ourselves to build this bad habit of trying to cut corners, trying to take the easy way, trying to get whatever we can out of every relationship and situation, then we might look around and say, why is the Lord making my marriage so difficult? Why is the Lord making it so I have no friends? Why is he making it so I'm just not happy in my life? And it's easy to point the finger, but the reality is it all comes back to us not being willing to do the work. And so this is our big message this morning, is that this is a sad, difficult story to read from the Word. And this is a sad and difficult commandment to think about in our lives. But the other side of it is that it doesn't have to be. Because when we commit ourselves to working against this, when we commit ourselves to following this commandment and we say, I am going to, instead of building a habit of taking the easy way, I'm going to work on building a habit of doing things the right way. I'm going to focus myself on doing the work then instead of us and all the people around us having to suffer because of our choices, we have the benefit of all of the people around us being able to feel the happiness and the joy and the love that come from us doing our work. And so this is what I want us all to do this week. When we walk out of here and we go into this week, I want us to all think about this this week and try to catch ourselves if at any point this week we find ourselves saying, I want to just do this the easy way, even if it's something as simple as, oh, I don't want to rinse this dish before I put it in the dishwasher, let's try this week to catch ourselves and say, no, you know what? I'm going to do this the right way. I'm going to do the work and see how this affects us. Let's see how much focusing on doing the work and doing things right instead of doing things easily, how much that helps us build the courage and the stamina and the ability to do what is right when it really matters. And if we do this and continue working on this day after day, week after week, then not only will our life get better, but all of the people we love, our family, our friends, their lives will all be better because of our commitment to doing the work and following the Lord's commandments. Amen. Please rise for a blessing.